Imagine the day you die, 42 people show up to your funeral. A year later, maybe your mom shows up, maybe one of your kids show up. Five years later, you're in heaven looking down saying, how come none of you guys are coming back to my plot anymore? What happened? Didn't I do something good with my life? How come you're not coming back to visit? For the person that's not doing anything with their lives, I tell you, there's a lot of different pains in life. You do not want to be the name of somebody that's forgotten, irrelevant, or left behind. It is the most depressing, difficult places to be, and you and I have a choice to do something about it. So unless if somebody listens to this, and they say, I don't care about that, no problem. There are certain people that are like, you know what, I really don't care about that. But I think even half of the people that say, I don't really care about that, they do. Yeah. It's their cop out. <laughs> it's the way to avoid the responsibility. It's the way to not have to do the work. It's the way to say, well, this is why I'm not winning and I have an excuse, but you don't. This is why X, Y, Z, but almost everyone I know has some kind of dreams. It's on them to have the courage to want to change and do something about it. Yeah. But that part, you and I can't do nothing about, man. They got to do it. Welcome to another edition of Social Proof Podcast. We are here with uh, someone I've watched and uh, just just been following for, uh, about, I guess, maybe a year now, man. I had no idea who you were until I heard you speak and I was wowed. Because it just seems like it's just, it's just rolling off the top of your head. My, Patrick Bet David, um, I, I, I have one question that I've, I've been like pressing myself to ask you. How do you, how did you become so prolific in the words that come out of your mouth? Because I've only seen one, two people, Jim Rohn and my friend Myron Golden. Just the, the words that come out of your mouth, they're framed in such a way where it's just, whoa, how do you get like that? I, you know, I couldn't tell you, but what I can tell you, uh, uh, first of all, it's good to be on your podcast with oh, you, David. But uh, what I can tell you is... Um, I've been a curious, I've been known as the curious guy since I was a kid, even in Iran. I was a guy that would walk home from junior high school in Verdugo and we'd go for a 30 minute walk and my friends would take the longer walk with me because I'm telling them stories and we're playing this game. Hey, if you had a choice between three different things, four different things, would you rather be the richest man in the world? Would you rather be a president? Would you rather be the greatest basketball player or would you rather be the you know greatest performer? So Jordan, Michael Jackson, whoever was the richest man at that time, or the president at that time. We'd start this conversation and imagine if one day you had this, what would you do? So it's it's curiosity, it's storytelling, and then you know having read a couple thousand books probably helps as well. <laughs> with your with your busy schedule, you still read a lot? Oh yeah, I don't have a choice. I'm I'm uh, reading a, a specific chapter of a book right now. I'm reading. Uh, studying a couple different consulting firms on how they did it, McKinsey, Gartner, trying to learn more about it. I go by niches what I read. So I read like, I'm gonna go study over how to raise money. So I read 10 books on raising money. Go on and hey, how, how to start a media company. So I'll read all the books of the giants, how they build their media company. Go on and talking about how to invest different philosophies. So I'll read everything on that. Right now it's, how, how it's do you building find, consulting firms. How do you find the time? Where, like, you, you gotta walk me through how you're reading all these books because I probably don't have half the things you have going on. And we have a, actually a book club in our uh, morning group and we read like a chapter every day, right? But I don't have as, nearly as much as you have going on. Where are you finding the time? Is it audio? Is it yeah, so it would be audio, it would be book, it would be, uh, uh, but it's, if I'm, if I'm reading a biography, I can get it in audio and read, listen to a 2.0 speed. I can get that done, no problem. If I'm reading a business strategy book, I can't listen to it. I have to read it because I need to be focused on how you do X, Y, Z. But if it's autobiography and it's a storytelling, you're kind of staying with the narrator. I can't do uh, uh, the business books that way. And then with podcast prep, you know, content, research, kids are asleep at 9, 30, 10 o'clock. I got a couple hours to do what I'm doing there. And then drive time, you'd be amazed how much you have with drive time, travel, flying. Um, but more than anything else, if, 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 you're, if you stay in curious mode, it's not how do you do it. It's like food. You know, how do you find three times a day or four times a day to eat? <laughs> you're feeding yourself. So the right. same way you're feeding your you know, your belly, you're feeding your mind as well. 
we don't ask the question, how, how do we find time to eat? But we ask the question, how do we find time to book, to read books, where it needs to be the other way around. How do you find time to eat? Because you're <laughs> definitely going to priority between the two if you really looked at them the same way. We have plenty of time to read. Yeah, for sure, yeah. for sure. Um, we were just talking, and I don't know, can we talk about it? Like, sure, we're just of talking course. About, okay, cool. Yeah. So you were talking about, um, you, were, you had a meeting about what you're not going to do in the following year yeah. versus what you're going to do in all the plans. How did that conversation go? So, so I just said, every quarter I meet with my Golden Sachs guy. He flies in, me and my wife, we go, we sit there, we talk about how the market's done, what's going on. I had dinner last week with David Solomon I'm sorry, in Miami. You're, you're, you're Goldman Sachs guy, what do you mean? He's my advisor, he's my financial oh, advisor. Nice. Yeah, right. so, and we're having dinner last week, so we're looking at what's gonna happen in 2023. And we're sitting there going through all the projects that we have going on, how the consulting firm is doing, how the insurance company is doing, how the media company is doing, how Manect, our technology company is doing. We're looking at everything. And then, then we have to look at what are we taking off the table? So, hey, speaking gigs, couple hundred thousand dollars an hour to go speak here. Well, maybe this year we're only gonna do it if we're only going to the following opportunities, because that's gonna help with this, and that's a you know, relationship that's gonna lead to this, and it's gonna match the calendar, because these are the three months you're available to do this, versus let's take this out, let's take that out. So the mindset becomes more about not having a to-do list, but do not do list. Like, I am no longer gonna do this. I am no longer gonna do that. Yeah. And that frees up time to put more into, we had a meeting a month ago, and I sat down with our leaders here, and I said, I don't want to go wide right now. I just want to go deep. We have way too many companies and projects that we're managing that we keep adding another one and another one and another one. I want to take these things here and go hire the right leaders and executives to take it deeper and deeper and deeper. Let's strengthen these companies and then increase valuation and then possibly consider this. But we're not at a point right now to go more. We have... I think it's nine companies we're operating right now, mm. and uh, they're all doing good. A couple of them are doing great, and uh, you know we need we need to be more focused. In the next twelve months, I'd like to hire somewhere around six to ten C-suite executives, two hundred thousand plus range salary bonuses to find the right leaders. Because it, it, you know from the outside, like this week, my schedule this week's been a insane schedule this week. The December, I had a meeting this week with the board, they flew in. Then the next day we had all the major insurance companies I work with, we bring them in, we enter, you know, entertain them, take them to Prime Steakhouse. And then the next day I'm you know, having a you know, message with them on what we're doing for 2023, what went good, bad, ugly in 2022, what things we're concerned about, what's going on with the State of the Union of insurance industry with ourselves. Then the following day I had four masterminds here with our insurance executives. Each of them was hosted uh, by a different executive and one group had 40 people. I went and spoke to those guys for two hours and I had a two hour break, went to the next one, spoke for two and a half hours and I went to the next one at a different location, two hours. Then I went to the last one, spoke there for two and a half hours and then I stayed with those guys and we played spades all night till three o'clock in the morning because I was being punked by these guys by, from New Orleans, Memphis, Chicago, thinking just because I'm Middle Eastern, I don't know how to play spades. And we showed them we know how to split, play spades. For and sure. then the next day, which was last night, I uh, brought uh, the top guys, 100 people with their spouses. We put a party at the house last night. We wrapped up at 12.30 Sunday night. And then I'm back at it again this morning. So it's, it's a lot of intentional thinking of what is gonna deserve our attention this year and what we need to set aside and then get a little bit more disciplined by bringing the right support so it gives us more time to give attention to those things that are growing. Do you consider the things that's going on in the world in this decision? Like 100%. I mean, a lot of people, we're seeing like the layoffs yeah. and like people are quitting their job, but yeah. you're saying I need to hire more people. How do we start making those decisions? Even though it might be a good a good business model, like yeah. this is good, but maybe not for this season. Well, no, first of all, you, you, only you know how much money you got in the bank. Only you know how hard you work. Only you know how hard you want to work this year. Only you know, you know, like we can sit in front of the camera and act hard and then, but we know last time when we talked to our wife and we said, hey babe, I kind of want to tone it down 50% and I want to spend <laughs> more time this, I want to travel 60% less. Uh, these are the conversations, right? I know what I'm saying in that conversation, and I want that conversation to match my behavior. So if I have a 20-year vision tied by another 20 years after that, 
and I'm willing to play offense aggressively right now, this is not a time to play defense. This is a time to play offense. And you can play offense if you've made the right choices the last five years, 10 years. If the last five years, you were planning on becoming a DECA millionaire because Bitcoin was gonna to go to a quarter million dollars, <laughs> well then you took a hit. Yeah. If you were planning on becoming a millionaire because you thought a, a handful of NFTs, you thought the land you were gonna sell for 5.2 million and you bought it for 10 grand, well then you took a risk. Yeah. Because the get rich quick type of models, man, that takes a lot of people out. But you know if your philosophy is a real philosophy built on data, growth, real substance versus just pure luck, I'm hoping to get rich. There's a lot of crypto millionaires right now that are Uber drivers. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of NFT millionaires that are right now Uber drivers. I like, uh, I remember being 21 years old, I've gotten out of the army and I'm down to my last penny. So, but I got my credit cards, MBN, all these other things, I got my credit cards and I'm sick and tired of it. But I'm a, I'm a big gambler at that time. I'm going to Vegas, I'm playing poker, I'm really? doing all this stuff. And I have 49K in debt. I said, I know I'm gonna pay it off. I go take all the money out of my credit cards. I go with a handful of my friends and they know who they are. Freddie, a bunch of these guys. We get in the expedition, we go to Vegas. This is the big plan? This is the big plan. I take $25,000 and I said, boom. I'm gonna start with, I'm gonna play whatever, $1,000 hand. If I lose, I'll play $2,000 hand. If I lose, I'll play $4,000 hand. If I lose, I'll play $8,000 hand. Well, there's no way in the world I'm gonna lose like you know, whatever the number was, the way I had calculated it. I'm not gonna lose 12 hands in a row. Well, I lost 12 hands in a row. So I, I lose all my money. So then I come back, I'm in debt 49K. I was the guy, the uh, crypto millionaire that is now driving Uber, I was that yeah. guy. So I hit rock bottom, girl, finance, all this stuff happens. I'm sitting there saying, you know, I'm gonna go back into the army because that's the easy way, you know, f flight, fight, freeze, I'm flight. Yeah. I'm like, I'm gonna go into the army. That's yeah. what I'm gonna do. I'm not the freeze guy. I'm just gonna go back. I know what to do with the army. I'll do 20 years. They're gonna pay off my debt. I have a nice $4,000 pension. I'll go become a cop or a firefighter afterwards. I'm probably gonna be married mm. maybe two or three times because you're in the military, you don't get married once. I got a few kids, I'll get the benefits and I'm good. How so, old are you at this point? 21, 21, 21, 21 years old. So yeah. I come out and I'm like, yeah, I can't. You can't constantly run away from problems. Your habits suck. Your mindset sucks. You're trying to look for a quick way of doing this. This thing takes work. So I came back, I started creating a discipline of, uh, of reading books, learning about finance economy. Then I worked at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter, got into finance. I said, I'm gonna be in the financial industry for 20 years. My 20 years came up last year, 2021 wow. makes it 20 years. I'm in financial industry now for 21 years. So then wealth was created. So if everything you're doing right now for the most part is intentional, then you're intentionally growing hiring today. If you were winging it, being hopeful that you're making the right choices, mm. then you're in a scary place today. Got it. My audience is predominantly kind of maybe like the Uber driver that has a dream, the job and a dream and they're trying to bridge that gap, yep. right? So I, I don't even do coaching, teaching people how to go from 1 million to 3 million. I could maybe teach, but it's not my audience, right? I want to know like what you see, because you come across a lot of like entrepreneurs on every level. For the person that like wants to get something going, if you could attribute it, could, if you could attribute their success to three things, what would it be? So somebody that's uh, uh, maybe got a side hustle, who's an Uber job, 50, making fifty hundred grand a year. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So so look, you know, the the first thing you got to do is you got to ask a very straight up question of yourself. Okay, um, how much money you got in the bank? How much total net worth do you have right now? What's the most you've ever had before? Are you happy with those numbers? So if you said, I got 28 grand in a bank, most I've ever had is 35 grand, you know, no, I'm not happy with where I'm at, yeah. and I'm willing to change. So then you gotta ask yourself, okay, if you're not happy with the results today, that means the way you process issues doesn't produce the kind of results you want. So meaning, your way of thinking got you to have the life that you have today, yeah. okay? So let's unpack your way of thinking. So I had a guy, a friend of mine, that I used to party with a lot, so he would call me when I was trying to make it, and he had no desire to want to make it. Yeah. This guy was a 
guy that wanted to stay home and take care of his kid and his wife would work. I'm not that guy. Yeah. I'm a guy that likes to work, but that's the life he chose to live. I noticed every time he would call me, he was a downer, he was negative, he was annoying, but I felt it was part of my duty to be loyal to him because if I didn't, I'm being out of character and I felt guilt. That guilt got me to pick up the phone call of a friend that every single time <laughs> about everybody. So I would be on the phone with him for 45 minutes. He would bitch about his wife, he would bitch about his mom, he would bitch about his dad, he would bitch about his friends. He would literally about everything. And then I knew when he got off the phone, he's gonna call somebody else and he's gonna bitch about me. <laughs> I knew that for a fact that it's gonna be taking place, right? So finally one day I said, listen, do you realize every time you call me it's bad news? I said, tell me the last time you call me with good news. And he says, life isn't always good, man. People got problems. I said, I totally get it. But I want you to tell me the last time you called me with some good news. I said, moving forward, I don't want you to call me anymore. Really? Because you drain me. This is too much. So how do you train somebody that you don't want to talk to anymore and it's once a year? When they call, you let the phone ring twice, then you press end. You don't ignore it because they know maybe they missed a call. <laughs> and if you press end early, they think you're in bad reception area. But if you wait two seconds and then you press end, they know. Right. You press end. Right. Okay? So then the when science I, behind it, it. It's, there's a science behind it. So he realized, man, either I got to be in the hunt to go after my dreams or Pat's not going to want to talk to me. And honestly, I got over the whole guilt factor of that, yeah. that I don't want to call and don't want to talk to you if you're constantly a downer. A lot of times when you're an Uber driver, you're making 40, 50, 60,000 dollars a year, people around you are making the same kind of money as well. It's not like the people around you are making a million, two million, five million, 10 million. It's, it's challenging for you to be friends with them because typically one of two things will happen. So let's just say you make a million a year and you're super disciplined, you're after it, you're crushing it in life, yeah. married, kids, everything you're doing, it's intentional. And I'm kind of like the guy who used to play basketball in high school, I was your point guard, right. you were the shooting guard. So we're boys, we party together, we got history, girlfriends, all that stuff, we have that memory, but now you're married, I'm still single. Okay, so say you call me on a Friday and I say, hey, Pat, what you got going on tonight? I said, nothing, he says, man, listen, uh, you got the Hawks are playing Milwaukee, mm -hmm. And Trey's going against Giannis. Mm -hmm. Man, I got courtside seats. You want to go? I said, hell yeah. He says, dude, I got tickets. Six seats. It's four grand a pop. Okay? Now, say I'm making 50. All right. And you're making a mil. Yeah. How am I going to receive that phone call when he called me? Let's process that together. One, I'm going to say, you know I can't afford four grand for a yeah. ticket. Why are you calling me? Two, I'm going to say, I know you can afford it. Why don't you pay for me? Three, I'm just gonna make up some story to say I'm busy. But regardless of what it is, you're losing, Yeah, not me. One, I'm gonna uh, inject guilt in you on why are you calling me? Two, if you don't pay, I'm gonna inject guilt again. Three, I'm gonna have to make up some story not to go with you. Or if I spend the $4,000 to go with you, I shouldn't do it, because I don't have that kind of money. Yeah. So, so now you are afraid to call me next time. So there's only a matter, like let's just say, hey, Christmas, my wife, we want to create family rituals. This Christmas, we want to go to Aspen, man. We got this cabin, five bedrooms. We want you to bring your family with you. I'm like, dude, I can't bring my family to, you know, let's split the private jet, let's go together, man. It's only 100 grand. <laughs> you do 50, I do 50. This is not the fact that to you, your entire life is about money. Yeah. And to me, my life isn't about money. You've taken those things a little bit more. We came from the same hood. Yeah. We came from the same high school. We came from the same, we've seen the same drug, same coke, same ecstasy, yeah. same crack, same pot, same gang, same blood, crack, blood diamond, MS, it doesn't matter. We've seen the same thing, yeah. right? You changed the way you think, I did not. All right, listen, every single week, every episode, you hear me talking about the morningmeetup.com. It's the community. Let me show you what's happening here. Every single morning, Monday through Friday, there's 400 plus people on a Zoom call, right? We're learning, we're talking, we're growing together, and this is you. There's all these people here. It's all these people in the morning meetup. Hundreds of people reading books, growing, we get together quarterly. It's amazing. And for some reason, you just keep looking at, just go to themorningmeetup.com and get in the circle. And then you'll be like way happier. Just themorningmeetup.com. Let's get back to the episode. So for people that are in that situation, let me tell you what I did this week, which was a very special thing. Did you see the interview I did with Antonio Brown? I don't know if you saw that or no, not. No, that, that was next on my YouTube yeah, list. So too. Antonio Brown and I are sitting together. If you've seen it, 
He gets upset. He says, you idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. He's sitting right here where you're sitting. Really? It's like four weeks ago. He was serious. And, yeah, he was serious. So it's a very, very complicated interview with A.B. So I said, A.B., you know, uh, uh, so he says, you didn't come from the streets. I came from the streets. I said, listen, my parents got a divorce twice. Divorced family. I came from the streets of L.A. My dad was a cashier in Inglewood, California. Mm. He said, where I grew up, Liberty City, people get shot at. I said, what do you think happens in Inglewood when my dad was working on that? Yeah. So I grew up at Iran. We got bombed on. He says, no, that's because you chose to join the army. I said, I didn't have a choice. I was born in Iran. <laughs> There's no choice there, right? But let me tell you what happened. He kept telling me about Liberty City. I said, no problem. You want to create a paradigm shift for me? I'll accept it, A.B. Here's what I'm going to do. On Wednesday, I tell my guys, I want to go to Liberty City. So I go to Liberty City, and I go to find a Winn-Dixie in Liberty City. We go to that Winn-Dixie. Right across the street, there's a shooting bodies on the ground. Cops are picking up the bodies. Up, and we have this on video. You'll see it. That, not that day, that hour Sheesh. is what we're talking about. I go to Liberty City. The manager of Liberty City, I tell him I want to be a bagger. So I'm wearing the outfit of a bagger. I got the picture right here for you. <laughs> I'm dressed as a bagger at Liberty City Winn-Dixie is what I'm doing, okay? Mm -hmm. I get in there, and this is me right here. I get in there, that's me. I'm a bagger, Winn-Dixie, you'll see the whole video. <laughs> me and Heather, that's Heather. Heather's a cashier right. right there, and I'm doing the bagging stuff. Yep. People are coming by. So, so, hey, Yolanda, how you doing? Good. Is that your son? Yes, how old is he? Five months. Hey, Ma, where's the diapers? Do we need diapers? Oh, we need diapers. We can't afford it right now. What else are the diapers? I go to aisle five. I pick up all the diapers. I bring them to them. For an hour on aisle number seven, I was paying everyone's groceries. Wow. I said, hey, Merry Christmas, 280. Merry Christmas, 320. And then people started realizing, go to aisle seven. <laughs> and then aisle seven became the popular line, right? right? But the entire time, one of the ladies at the end was 85 years old. She says, who are you? I said, I'm just a regular guy. She says, no, you're not. I said, I'm telling you, I'm just a regular guy. Why are you doing this? I said, why am I doing this? Yeah, I said, because you said you're 85. She says, yes. I said, okay. You were a teacher for 42 years? I was. I said, my dad did this for 15 years in Inglewood. He got held up three times. Every time he got held up, he would give him the Bible. And he would talk about God with them. Mm. Eventually, they loved my dad because they tre he treated everybody like regular people. He wasn't afraid of gangsters. And he didn't see the drug as a bad person. He just talked to the people. And he would constantly figure out a way to get close to them. I said, my dad's 80. My dad's standing right there. My dad's standing right behind me wow. while he's watching me doing this. Okay? Sometimes in life, we need a paradigm shift. If you're rich, you need to take your kids to a place to see how rough life can be. If you're poor, you need to go look at a $3 million home with yeah. a realtor. You need to go to a Ferrari dealership. You need to go to a land. I remember I used to go to a Ferrari dealership, David. And I would say, I played one game. Here's what my game was. It's a sick game I would play. I'm broke. I got nothing <laughs> on my name. I'm so poor, it sucks. I'm about to go back in the army, but I would say, I want to find out if they believe I'm rich. I want to see if this Ferrari salesperson <laughs> believes I can afford to buy a Ferrari. So I would go to the dealership and I would walk around. You know what I would say? Man, the guy's ignored. He doesn't even say hi. Right. You know why? He knows I can't afford it. He feels the vibe. Mm. So a year later, I would go back in. Still doesn't talk to me. A year later, I go back in. How are you? Good. I still can't afford it, but now he believes I can't afford it. That's all that matters. <laughs> so then I would go to Mulholland Drive, and I, would, I went one time to look at this $3.5 million house, open house. Mm -hmm. I walk in. said, how you doing? Good. Um, what can you tell me about this property? And she leaves a customer and comes with me and spends 45 minutes showing the home. This is at a time that I can only probably buy a $700,000 property. But the fact that she thought and believed my aura my energy was a character of somebody that could afford to buy a three and a half million dollar house it made me believe that i'm on my way to be able to buy a three and a half million dollar house so today i live in a 30 million dollar house i don't now it's a different story but during that time so if somebody that's driving the uber car right now you got to create the other kind of paradigm shifts for you wow you got to go to a complete different environment to get yourself to say why not me why not my family? Why can't I do something about it? So yeah. if you're doing Uber, you can no longer. I went on a diet of music. You know when people talking about hip hop? I don't know Lamar. The other day I was asking guys who are the top five rappers right now. One guy said Little Baby's number one. This person's number 10. They're going back and forth debating, right? You know who I know? I know up until 2003, <laughs> 2002. Because I went on a radio diet. Yeah. 
I've never, I've not turned on the radio since 2002. Wow. You tell me any R and B if you want to play the game of R and B. I can tell you wrong. Mm-hmm. Every time I see you, it makes me. <laughs> I can sure. tell you, Uncle Sam. I don't ever want to see you. I can go to Brian McKnight. Yeah. You know, I can go to, you know, Atlantic's. I can go to yeah. As Yet. I can go to, you know, anything with Tupac, anything with Biggie. I can go to one of the greatest albums of all time by DMX. I can go Mo Murder by Bone Thugs and Harmony. I think it's number sixteen. I can go to. I can go to Blackstreet's album, tell you exactly which one is the baby making music to listen to. You know, don't leave me. I can go to Usher, tell you my way. I can go to all of that stuff. But my timeline ends at 02. Because if you're an Uber driver and you're serious about your dreams, go on a radio diet for one year. No radio for you this year. Nothing. No radio, no Spotify. The only thing you listen to all year this year is audiobooks, if you're an Uber driver. All business, all intentional, all vision, all autobiographies, let people inspire you. Can the person that's listening to this right now making 50K a year saying, Pat, David, I'm ready, I'm committed, no problem. Can you go on a Spotify, on an iTunes, on a diet, nothing for an entire year? Now, when you work out, listen to your hip hop. Yeah. Fire yourself up. I listen to hit up hit him up when I'm working out. I listen to my hip hop music when I'm working out because it's getting me going. But I went on a radio diet since oh two till today. I've never once listened to the radio. Oh. So those are the things that the exchanges people need to make to have a paradigm shift. And this is coming from a guy that had a one point eight GPA in high school. Yeah. I'm not the guy that you know came out of a family that I'm supposed to be somebody. So that's what I would say to those folks. What about the people who? Um they, they understand that mindset and they're uh, kind of like the information junkie, right? I mean, they're listening to every podcast, they're listening to you, but they don't actually do the stuff that you're saying do. Like, how, how do we break out of, okay, I know the right thing to do is to, to inject myself with good information, yeah. but I can't seem to do anything. You know, it, 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 let's say these guys have kids, okay? Let's say you... Uh, uh, it, it, I don't know anybody that I've met in my life who doesn't watch a movie with dreams, whether it's Rocky Four, whether it's Gladiator, the story of redemption, or even maybe a little bit of revenge, or you watch Stand Lean On Me, I think by, uh, who's in it, Morgan Freeman, is that the one yeah. that I'm saying, Lean yeah. On Me, and you're seeing the pride of a teacher, principal that comes in that wants to change the culture of a place, or a pursuit of happiness, or you watch a... You know, any of these movies where somebody goes from being a nobody to having their dreams become a reality. I've watched Rocky IV a couple hundred times, right? Something happens to us because we for a split second believe one day I want that to happen to me. What if that happens to my life? Great. For the person that doesn't take any action and it's just kind of sitting there living a regular life, you know, there's, there's nothing worse than being forgotten about when I was studying for my Series 7, I would go to Forest Lawn, and I studied for my Series 7 right next to my grandma's plot. So she, her plot is right there. She had just passed away, so I'm studying my Dearborn Yellow Book, and I'm going through this whole thing, and I'm studying right there. It's outside. And uh, when I would take a break, and I would leave my stuff, I'd go for a walk. Mm. And I would walk past different plots, and I would say, born 1962, dead 2001. Born 1954, dead 1988. Yeah, I don't know that name. Yeah, I don't know that name. Yeah, I don't know that name. Don't know that name. And all of a sudden, I'm like, wow, who is this guy? Wow, that's his plot? Mm. That's crazy. Interesting. Then I go to, and I would Google the names. Yeah, but I don't know that name. I don't know that name. I don't know that name. You know what it's like to go into a room and no one notices you? You ever seen the movie Sixth Sense with Bruce Willis? Yeah. Where he's thinking the kid is dead and then he realizes he's the one that's dead, that yeah. he's trying to play the role. It's a very weird twist. Imagine nobody notices you. Imagine you disappear. Imagine the day you die, 42 people show up to your funeral. A year later, maybe your mom shows up. Maybe one of your kids show up. Five years later, you're in heaven looking down saying, how come none of you guys are coming back to my plot anymore? What happened? Didn't I do something good with my life? How come you're not coming back to visit? For the person that's not doing anything with their lives, I tell you, there's a lot of different pains in life. You do not want to be the name of somebody that's forgotten, irrelevant, or left behind. It is the most depressing, difficult places to be 
and you and I have a choice to do something about it. So unless if somebody listens to this and they say, ah, I don't care about that, no problem. There are certain people that are like, yeah. you know what, I really don't care about that. But I think even half of the people that say, I don't really care about that, they do. Yeah. It's their cop out. <laughs> it's the way to avoid the responsibility. It's the way to not have to do the work. It's the way to say, well, this is why I'm not winning and I have an excuse, but you don't. This is why X, Y, Z, but almost everyone I know has some kind of dreams. It's on them to have the courage to want to change and do something about it. Yeah. But that part, you and I can't do nothing about, man. They got to do it. Listen, if I was going to teach you how to make a million dollars, would you give me 10000 Like if I had a course teach you how to make a million dollars and you're positive, you're going to make a million dollars, would you give me 10000 Of course you would. It's no-brainer, right? So in a calendar year, we make seven figures with the podcast. But there's 21 things that I extracted from that that you're going to need to launch a podcast. But I only got time to give you three right now. One is you need a distribution platform. The distribution platform is what you upload your podcast to. That platform sends it to Spotify, Apple, Google Play, so that your supporters can actually listen to your podcast. You're also going to need a microphone. You need a really good microphone so it's crispy audio. And three, you need an income strategy. This is not necessarily a hobby, unless you're going to make it a hobby. But I can teach you how I made the seven figures with these 21 things. Now, the good news is you don't have to give me 10,000. My ebook is only 37 bucks, okay? So listen, go to podcastebook.com and get the 21 things that you need. And I, I can explain it in detail, all the things that you need, okay? Podcastebook.com. Let's get to the episode. Yeah, I, I remember working at the Cheesecake Factory and I, I remember saying to myself that um, I don't really need to have, like I think my friend was talking about like all the stuff that they want to have and a you know, big, you know, 10 bedroom house and things of that nature. And I was like, oh, I don't really need all that. And I said, I think somehow we were talking about like hitting the lottery. And I said, well, if I hit the lottery, I would just still work here because I don't really need the money, right? I realized that wasn't the truth, but I, I did convince myself because I remember feeling that like success is this gated community where you have to like know somebody to let you in. I just, I just couldn't understand how I was going to become successful. That's why I resonate like with this audience that we're talking to right now so much because they want it. They just don't know what to do next. Well, I, I relate to as well, but I don't relate to excuses. Mm -hmm. I just don't. I have a very, very hard time relating to people that, um, I'll give you an idea. Think about this question here. What would you say are the ugliest qualities you've ever met? We all, people have different kind of ugly qualities. Selfishness. Selfishness, okay, so you think selfishness is the ugliest one. I think there's uglier than selfish because I think you're also selfish. I think I'm also selfish. I think our kids are selfish. I think pastors are selfish. I think Michael Jordan, shit, he was definitely selfish, yeah. right? And you know, it benefited the people on his team. Yeah. But there is a definition of selfish, right? What else would you say is the ugliest? So we ugliest selfish quality. as one of them. Um, jealousy? Jealousy, what else? I don't disagree. What um, else? Um, hate. What else? Uh, 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 ugliest qualities. So selfish, jealousy, hate, uh, what else? Um, I don't know what to call Let it. Let me rephrase that. How about unattractive? Where you're like, oh, that, that energy is just very unattractive. Yeah. What would you um, say it is? I really get rubbed the wrong way by like heavy arrogance. Like when someone comes around and talks about themselves as if they are like bigger than everyone else. Um, and yeah, it's negativity. Okay. So I will say for me, unattractive is helpless. Very unattractive. Blame, very unattractive. <laughs> uh, guilt, yeah. putting guilt on others, very unattractive. Um, uh, uh, what else can I tell you? Always feeling sorry, self-pity, super unattractive. I once read a book called Power Versus Force. Mm -hmm. And I read this book 20 years ago, and it talks about the different levels of consciousness, okay? From the lowest to the highest. So level of consciousness, power versus force. I read this book uh, uh, 20 years ago, and he explains the different levels, from the lowest level to the highest one. So. Right in the middle is when life flips to us actually having power versus we're forcing it. The lowest level of consciousness I think he talks about is apathy or grief, guilt, and those are the lowest level. And then there's desire, there's anger, and anger is the highest of the worst level, meaning like it's actually better than grief, apathy, all of that. Mm -hmm. And then after anger comes courage. Courage is 
I have the courage to fail. You have the courage to start a podcast with a quarter million of subscribers and somebody comments and says, David, you suck. I don't like your interview style. <laughs> or you know what, David? I can't believe you had this guest, Patrick B. David, on. Why would you do that? Or why would you say capitalism works? You understand how hard life is? That's a risk you're taking when you make a video. Yeah. Some people come after you. You're not going to get 100% positive comments. But you have the courage to say, look, at least I'm creating something, yeah. right? Then after courage comes neutrality, where you're willing to kind of see both sides. They, I may be off order, but then it goes to acceptance. I'm willing to accept you for who you are. It's totally fine, we're different. Yeah. You're willing to accept me. Then it becomes willingness. I'm willing to work with you. Then reason. Why don't we reason together? See if we can reason. Mm. So there's these levels all the way at the top is enlightenment, which we're not gonna get to. That's Jesus, he's talking about like, people who are extreme high spiritual leaders, then it's joy, then it's love, then it's happy, okay? So you're working with these levels. For somebody that's, you're saying your friend who was, you know, I don't care if I ever win the lot, I'm still doing the same job. That's what I'm gonna be doing, right? Like, yeah, okay, well, things change later on. You know, people have to just realize and identify for themselves what qualities are ugly. So if, if I'm talking victimhood language always, but you don't understand how I grew up, oh my God, I can guarantee you there's millions of stories of people that had a harder life than you yeah. that would exchange their problems with you. But you know what I've gone through? You don't know what it was like for me to grow up in LA. You don't know what it was like for me to do this. You know why I know that language very well? Because that was me yeah. until 18 years old. So 18, Til 18 years when the light switch? Because for me, I grew up in a family where my mother's side, they were communists, my dad's side were imperialists, and my mother's side, they always blamed, and they always were like, but no, we're never gonna be rich. We're, like, I remember one time I was 14 years Real old. Real quick, imperialist? Communist. Can you explain those? Yes, imperialism is like, uh, you know, like uh, UK, you know, where there's a king, there's a queen. Right. Iran, it was an imperialism. Yeah. And my mother was more, because they escaped from Russia, her family did, so they read Communist Manifesto. So mm -hmm. they believe rich people are bad people. They believe rich people are greedy. They believe rich people to take their money and should give it to other people and all this other stuff, right? So I'm this kid growing up and I'm like, oh my God, these rich people suck. And I had an uncle, his name was uh, Luther <clears throat> al Khase, who just passed away a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, I always thought this was a bad guy. And I'm like, man, I'd go, I'm like, why, why is this guy such a bad guy? And then every summer, my dad would take me to his house once a year. He lived right next to Snoop in Upland, uh, oh, wow. off of San Antonio. He had a 7,200 square foot, uh, square foot house. He always had a blue uh, a Cadillac, the real cool Cadillacs and a Jaguar. He was a Jaguar guy. Basketball court in the back, swimming pool, mm. nice office, beautiful kitchen that would always be there. And I would say, if he's such a bad guy, why do all his kids love him? <laughs> if he's such a bad guy, why, why do his in-laws love him? Why do his son-in-law marry to his daughter? Why do all these, if he's such a bad guy, why, why is every time I go on Sunday, 50, 60 people there and they're all laughing, having a good time, he's yeah. cooking for people, and he was successful, he was this, he was that. So I'm like, I don't know, mom, I don't know if I know this. And I remember one time I came home, I said, mom, are we Democrats or Republicans? I was 14 years old. And the teacher's talking about politics. Mm -hmm. I said, are we Democrats or Republicans? She says, we're Democrats. I said, cool, we're Democrats. I said, can I ask you why we're Democrats? She said, because Democrats are for the poor, Republicans are for the rich. Mm -hmm. I said to my mom, you know what I told my mom? What's that? I said, mom, when I grow up, I wanna be a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, though? absolutely. I have no clue what Republican right, means. Right, I just wanna make money. I'm just sick and tired of being poor yeah. and having people constantly feel sorry for me. Do you know when people bring stuff for you for Thanksgiving? They bring it once, thank you, because you're poor. They bring it twice. By the third time, I don't want you to feel sorry for me. It's an unattractive quality. Mm. I don't want you to look, the, you know the look when somebody looks at you with the feeling sorry look? I don't like that look. Yeah. I don't think people should like that look. I think maybe a little bit for a season that you're going through tough times. But if it's every year, now you're feeding into it. Now you're believing it. <laughs> Now your kids are starting to believe maybe we are victims. We're not victims. I'm in the army, we're in boot camp, and all of a sudden this mindset of motivation, I'm starting to really feed myself into it. 
You're 21, 22 around. At this time, I'm 18, 19. Cause I just, gotcha. I went into the army. I'm 18. Gotcha. And I, I remember one night we're in the barracks, and one of our guys was. He had a hard time because his girl left him and he wrote him a letter. He broke, she broke up over a letter. Ugh. Wife, that's tough, man. His wife. His wife, and we're in boot camp. His wife writes a letter to divorce him in a letter and he can't even call her. So he's in tears, he's crying. I'm like, I don't even know what to tell this guy. That's painful, bro. And I go up to him, I said, listen, man, I don't know what to tell you. Here's all I can tell you. This is what I go by. If you and I can walk, we can talk. You speak another language. You're a good looking guy. You're in shape, you take care of yourself. You have jokes, you have sense of humor, you can eat, you can hear music, you can speak, we can do all that stuff. We have all the senses to do something special with our lives. Sure. I said, it's all gonna be all right, man. It's gonna be painful for a few months, but everything's gonna be all right. Like this is what I'm trying to feed, tell this guy to, for him to kind of, nothing you say in a pain moment like that, the guy's gonna, yeah. but he's kind of going through it. You know what I realized eventually? I, I, I bought into that mindset. If you can walk, talk, speak a language, read, all the senses here, dude, you got every capability to change your life. Wow. So, so for us to buy into this, well, you know, but what if this person doesn't want to do it? What if that person doesn't want to do it? You've bought into what you've been telling yourself and it's now your truth, but it's not the truth. And unfortunately, your truth is stealing all your dreams away from you. And until you make a decision to want to change, nothing's going to change. Unfortunately, your mindset will most likely duplicate kids that also follow your mindset. Until one person has the courage to stop all that mindset, nothing's gonna change for that family. It's not easy to do, by the way. Change is a very hard thing, so. Man. So you encouraging someone else actually encouraged you. Like, is that oh one of the God. times where the lights, like, wow, I, I kind of believe this. Because you know you, you say stuff yeah. to people sometimes, yeah. like, you know what, that was actually true. Yeah. So when, when did like, when did the next gear hit for you? Like what point in your life? Cause I, I, for me, there was like, I can remember vividly, oh wow, a light bulb came off. And then three years later, this is a situation that happened and I wasn't looking for it, but it happened and it turned the light bulb on. What was the next gear for you? Well, I mean, look, you know, you and I, um, I don't know why this is, I don't know why this is, but if we go into a room, okay, say there's a, a uh, hundred people in this party and we don't know each other. Say we don't know each other, but we're required to live in this campus for one week together. Like-minded people are gonna find each other. Mm -hmm. I, I've ran a lot of different companies and offices. I don't know why negative people always find each other. <laughs> always, I don't know why. Complainers who complain about a certain technology, they always find each other. And I, I also don't know why the people that work out find each other, the people that go chasing skirts find each other, the, the people that collect cards find each other, the people that play dominoes find each other, mm. the people that watch movies, horror movies find each other, the people that wanna change their lives find each other, the people mm. that wanna do something big find each other. So what does this mean? If you, were to take inventory, the five people you spend the most time with right now, if they complain all the time, it's because you're a complainer. If the five people around you hang out the most are out of shape, odds are you're out of shape. Mm. If the five people you hang around with uh, are sports people, you're a sports guy. If the five people you hang around with do drugs, odds are you're gonna do it if you're not already doing it. Mm. If the five people around you all smoke cigarettes, you're a smoker. If the five people around you drink alcohol, you're you're gonna drink alcohol. This is different, Patrick, because most people that wanna change the blame their environment. Oh, all my friends, they're doing this and I'm trying to get away. Yeah. yeah. But you are the reason they are doing the thing they're doing. Well, you're 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 choosing that environment. You're choosing that environment because it's a comfort zone. So now here's what's uncomfortable. You know how annoying it is to have a friend that does the following. You know, like it's like well, when are you gonna go work out? Dude, just leave me alone. Dude, when are you gonna look at your belly? You, you, you gotta lose weight. That's yeah. an annoying friend. Yeah. Versus you would much rather be around other people that are not, not gonna say. You, like my dad will say, hey, you, you've been eating too much rice lately. I said, dad, you're cooking a rice. He's like, yeah, I know. I said, so listen, your stomach, he'll say it. But he said it to one of my friends. That one friend never showed up ever again to my house. I can tell you the guy's name. I mean, I remember the day he said it. Mm. He feared my dad. But that guy today is 350 pounds. And his blood level is very high. 
but he's afraid that someone's going to point that out. He would much rather be around other people that are not going to point out that he's heavy. Wow. So who's a real friend? The person that doesn't tell you that the person that does. So listen, I, I'm, I'm not saying this is easy. This is very hard. My change came when one day I finally realized I'm full of it. And I realized I'm a great salesperson. Mm-hmm. What do I mean by that? I sold myself on not giving my best yet. I was selling myself <laughs> on why I don't have the best life. I was selling myself why you're winning by highlighting your gifts and why I'm losing by highlighting my weaknesses. Mm. This is a form of selling because it's easy to cop out. I was so good at it. Yeah. I said, but if I'm this good at selling this, what if I can flip? The skill set of sales is the same. Yeah. I'm just selling the wrong product. What if I flip it? What if I'm able to sell myself on I can win because of these three talents that I have? What if I flip the script on myself? What will life look like? David, when I tell you I flipped the script like this, I remember one day I was the guy you wanted to go to clubs with. I'm that guy. I'm <laughs> telling you, you wanted to go to clubs and we would have a good time. One day, one of my good friends, I love this guy. We worked at Burger King together, Devine. He says, hey, man, we're going to the club. I said, no. I said, don't call me anymore. Go to the club. I'm not coming. He says, you know, Pat, I got to tell you something. I said, what's that? He says, I missed the old Pat. First time when he told me this, it was painful. I'm like, what do you mean you missed the old Pat? That's disrespectful. And I told him, I said, well, I got to tell you, man, I don't miss the guy. Mm. I like the new Pat. I would stay Friday night studying stocks. At 23 years old, who the hell does that? I would stay at the house and I'm reading a book. You know, one time at 25, which was the wildest thing I did. This is not, the don't do this unless if you're fully prepared for what's going to come with it. All right. I went 17 months with no sex. Mm. 17 months. Interesting. I said, I'm done. Because that was my obsession. There was a a party that would happen in Vegas. It was called called Pimps and Hoes. Mm -hmm. 17,000 people. That's the name of the party? You can Google it. You'll see it was the (laughs) biggest party that would put in Vegas. I didn't grow up in an environment where we're going to church and all this other stuff. That came at 25 and I became born again. But up until then, I'm the guy that's going to Vegas every other weekend. I'm the guy that in the army is drinking a small bottle of tequila every weekend with my friends yeah. on the way to Nashville, Tennessee. I'm that guy. I'm the guy that goes to Panama City to party at Club La Vila and mm-hmm. Spinnakers. I'm the, I went to Dublin's. I went to, you know, uh, 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 Miyagi's Palace, you know, Arena. I can give you Century Club, Garden of Eden. This is mm-hmm. Key Club. This is this, is this guy. Yeah. I was that guy that's partying constantly trying to go to new markets. And then one day... I meet a guy that he said three years he went without sex and he became a millionaire. I'm like, damn, that's a long time. Holy freaking. And I remember one day I'm with my girl. Three years. I'm with my girl. She's in, she's in Hollywood. She's an actress. She's beautiful. She does very well for herself right now. How She dresses all the major names. Beyonce, Lady Gaga. Mm. She runs one of the biggest PR firms in Hollywood, dresses all these girls. Anyways, we're together. We're in the car, expedition. I says, I want to tell you something here. What's that? We've been together for two and a half years. I want to know if we should get married or not, because we're at that phase. Mm-hmm. And she says, uh, what are you trying to say? I said, look, I love when we have sex. It's freaking awesome. I have a lot of fun with you. But I want us to go without it for a month to see what happens, to see if this relationship is deeper than just what we're doing in the backseat of this expedition. <laughs> and she says, you sure? I said, yeah. I said, is there another girl in your life? I said, I promise I got no. I said, she says, no, I know there's. I said, I'm telling you, I don't have another girl. It's mm-hmm. you. But let's go one month. So it's very weird. So I'm talking to her outside of her apartment. She says, you mean to tell me you want me to go inside right now? I said, yeah. She goes inside. Next day, it's Saturday. I pick her up. We go to movies. End up the movies. 11.15. We're parked in, in uh, Van Nuys. Mm-hmm. What do you want to do? I got to drop you off. This is two days. No sex. At the peak testosterone level. I'm on fire right now. You got 28 days left. She comes the next week. Birthday suit. Apartment. No sex. A week later, we're sitting in the car. We don't have anything to talk about. Mm. We have nothing to talk about. Then I told her, I said, we got to go to church. She said, I'm not going to church. What's happened to you? I said, dude, I said, nothing's happened to me. I just don't think if you and I are going to get married, we can make it work. We need a manual. We need something to help us out. No, I'm not going to church. Something's going on with you. She went to church one time. She thought it was very weird. I thought it was very weird. That church was a weird <laughs> church. And then, anyways, long story short, a couple weeks later, she's like, this is not working out. And we broke up. 
Okay, and the relationship was done. Very painful, by the way, when that happened. So we loved each other, but it was done. She moved on. Uh, we moved on, and you know, later on, we, my wife and her are friends. They'll talk. It's a very That's interesting good. relation. But the point is this. The point is, like, I wanted substance. And I wanted to find out what was my motivator. When I did that with the girl, and I went 17 months, during that 17 months, if you want to find the level of motivation that I got, I was on fire with work and dreams. I wanted my dad to work. I was sick and tired of him working at this 99 cent store in Inglewood, California. I wanted my sister to go on her honeymoon. I wanted my dad to go to Hawaii. I wanted me to have a life, man. I wanted to go out there and win. I wanted to make the Medivit family proud. And 17 months later, I started making the kind of money I've never made before. And then during that 17 months, I realized how much I can control my obsession and habits because I have an obsessive personality. Mm. That gave me confidence to know I can channel that obsession into other areas of my life. It's crazy when I tell these types of stories, people are like, yeah, what about this, what about that? Um, if you talk to this girl and she told you the story, she'd probably give you more detail, details of this and she would say it was so weird when we were going through it. I can imagine. That's exactly what I did. And you know, the rest is history. By the way, I didn't tell you it was easy. Yeah. I don't tell you I walk on water. I got a lot of skeletons. I got vices just like everybody else. I have flaws. I have insecurities. I have fears just like everybody else. Yeah. But I'm 44, man. When I look at my hands like this, I look young like this. I look 44 at this side of my hand. This side doesn't <laughs> lie to you. This side lies to you. You know, 44 is different than 24, different yeah. than 34. And yeah. Life's been very interesting so far, so I'm excited yeah. about the next, hopefully, 44 years. What are you afraid about now? Because you seem fearless, Yeah. right? Like, you just go after it, like you're just a brilliant man. Right now, in this day and age, what are you afraid of? Influence over my kids. Uh, I, I fear, um, you know, like, uh, 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 you see guys, uh, I had a friend of mine, who was this one of the smartest cats in our, in our circle. One day, we're at Wilson Junior High School, and this one guy smoking cigarettes, he's, we're 12, 13 years old at that time, he says, hey, come smoke cigarettes with us, he does. That same guy he smoked cigarettes with, turn him on to alcohol, turn him on to strip clubs, turn him on to weed, turn him on to X, turn him on to everything else that comes with it, special K, all this other stuff that comes with it. Mm. Eventually, the worst thing he got turned on to was Vicodin. He ended up dying on Vicodin. He was taking 50 a day of Vicodin. I took him to Tarzana Rehabilitation Center, 14 days, 400 bucks a day. And eventually one day, uh, went to sleep, never woke up. He had 50 in his system, done, dead at 27 years old. I think it was May 2nd of 05 when the guy died. Sharpest cat out of all of us. He had street smarts and book smarts. Very unique guy, loved him. Fun, tough, good personality, humor, kind of guy he wanted to hang out with. Um, you know how, I don't, did you ever get COVID or no? Did you? Have, yeah, once, okay. once. Do you know who you got it from? For sure. Do you know 100% who you got it from? Don't know. I don't either. Yeah. I don't either, but you got it and yeah. I got it. I don't know how bad it was for you. I lost 20 pounds when I got COVID. Wow. I lost a lot of, I couldn't eat for three weeks. It sucked for me. I just couldn't keep nothing down. So mm. when I was done with COVID and I got out, my wife looked at me saying, babe, you look so skinny. I said, dude, I can't eat nothing, okay? but you don't know where you got COVID from. I don't know where I got COVID from, okay? The spirit that ruins a person's life, it's so subtle that when it enters into one of your kids, it can stay there for 15, 20 years. COVID mm. you got for three weeks. A negative virus like a mindset or blame or victimhood can stay for a decade or two and steal all your dreams away from you. My biggest oh my fear gosh. is the educational system, the influence of two TV, movies, certain things that is being injected today, certain friends to all of a sudden get these guys to be, boom. They start believing whatever happened there, and I lose them for 20 years. I have one of my C-suite executives, his daughter. Oh my God. He says, my daughter and I were best friends. He says, Pat, you don't even understand. My daughter and I were best friends. I said, come on, bro. He said, I'm telling you, best friends. She loved. Her daddy, I was her favorite. I said, what happened? I sent her to university. Every six months she would come back. She was a little bit more angry with me. I don't understand why. She says, after four years, her promise was she would never leave where I was living. 
So she decided to go live in LA. She can't stand what I stand for. She, he says, he's getting emotional. He says, you have no clue how painful this is. And I don't know what that feeling is like because my kids are 10, 9, 6, and 17 months. I don't know that pain yet because they're still kids. Yesterday at the party, my 10-year-old son is just hanging out to me for like 30 minutes, right? And is leaning on me here. He was tired because he was by the beach all day at Palm Beach. And I'm telling this other guy, so this, this is only going to last a couple more years. This guy's not going to do that at 18 or 16. I'm going to be too old for this guy, right? But I don't think I have any more fears bigger than that. That, 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 is, a, that is a big fear. That's quite a thing to think of. Because no matter how much money you have, no matter how much information, wisdom, companies you build. Doesn't matter. You never know where it's going to come from. No, it doesn't matter. And it's not a virus that lasts a week or two weeks or four weeks. It's yeah. 10, 20, 30 years, sometimes lifetime. Goodness gracious, Pat. I got a couple more questions. Uh, I'm going to be selfish for a moment because I think I'm doing some things wrong as an entrepreneur. Uh, I have a, a group called The Morning Meetup, and uh, we meet every single day. It's maybe uh, about 1,000 people. We'll, we'll wrap up in a second. Okay. Um, about 1,000 people. And I want to like really, really grow it. Uh, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure how to. And, I'll, you know, our podcast is doing really, really well. We're doing about a million downloads a month. I want to get to 10 million. I don't know how to do it. What do you think I'm doing wrong? But I don't think you're doing anything wrong. I think you're doing a lot of things right to get to 255. That's not easy to do. First of all, you're very likable. You're trusting. You're chill. You're smooth. This is, you, this is, this is a gig you're doing that you're very good at. So keep doing this part. The only feedback I would give you is the following. So I, I, I was trying to give this to a couple of my talent, the podcast guys here. Here's what I said to them. I said, look, I started off when I started my YouTube channel. I wanted to talk about, I have videos that says top 20 best songs. Nobody cares about your top 20 best songs. I <laughs> uploaded in 2013, right? And I would do videos on sports, videos on this zero. Two years later, I got 2,000 subscribers. Finally, I chose one word, which my one word that I know a lot about is business capitalism. That's what I know a lot about. So entrepreneurship became my word. So for the next four years, I said, if you go on YouTube, I'm going to own the word entrepreneur. So during that five-year period, if you type in the word entrepreneur, 25 videos comes up, eight of them were me, uh -huh. okay? Ten of them were me. I owned that word for about five years. Then when I was going through it, I said, okay, now you have this audience, but there's so many other audiences that don't know you. What other, what other sources of interest do you have that you can really show a lot of curiosity in, that you have a lot of history on, and there's depth? Not like one layer or two layers of depth, but we're talking one guy can go one, another guy can go two, three, you can go four, five, six, seven layers of depth. depth. The more deeper you go, the more reach you got with an audience, because you interview better, right? So I said, okay. I like bodybuilding. What? It's got nothing to do with business, but I, I know a lot about bodybuilding. So I started interviewing. Boom, 25 million views. What? I would, how do you know so much about bodybuilding? Those people, there's this guy interviewing bodybuilders. He's a business guy. And then that audience showed up. Mob, because I, you know, mob. So I started interviewing mobsters. Wait, <laughs> what? Dope. So many people like Goodfellas, Godfather, this. You know, most CEOs, CEOs would say, favorite movie on power plays, Godfather 2, right? It's like the one everybody will say. Then it was Iran. What is Patrick Iran? Is he Puerto Rican? Is he Indian? What is Patrick? Then I say, you know, U.S.-Iran conflict. History, okay, 5 million views on Instagram or Facebook. 2 million views, 2.8 on YouTube. So then that audience showed up. Then China, then economy, then finance. Then So gradually, I went wider with topics. I stayed niche, but gradually I went wider in topic. And then those audiences showed up. Meanwhile... I'm recreating myself because if I'm constantly talking about the same stories, people will notice. But if I'm reading, if I'm consuming, if I'm recreating, the audience is going to say, something happened to David. Man, I don't recognize this guy. Mm. What was that story? I've never heard David tell that story before. Did you know what David's? I've never heard him tell that story before. What was that all about versus the same story you've told 72 times? Yeah. Now you're telling 72 new stories because you're, you're in something. You're like, listen, guys. These are five things I want to investigate in 2023. I want to learn more about raising money. I want to learn more about X, whatever those things are. For sure. And then that journey, your audience is going with you as well. 
but it's the whole concept of recreating yourself. There's a lot of content create. If I ask you right now who was a top entrepreneur YouTuber seven years ago, you would give a name. <laughs> but go look at that person's views today. Yeah, How okay. come it's flat? Because it's the same person they were seven years ago. Mm. And then you go look at somebody that's constantly have grown, you will see every year they recreated themselves. The concept of recreating is what keeps your content growing. Yeah, it's crazy. Your last answer answered my first question on how to become more prolific. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. Patrick Bet David, thank you my so man. much, my brother. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, this has been, I don't even know about the people watching it, but it's been helpful for me. So I think that's all that matters in this moment. But I know, I know you've helped so many people, and uh, I am honored, man. Thank you for taking time. Out. I appreciate you. Yes, this sir. was great. I enjoyed it. Thanks. Cool. If you like the video that you just watched, click this one. You're gonna like this one, maybe even more. Click it right now. Thank you, that was amazing. You're a great interview.